So what I really want to review and emphasize is two things in this section. One is the use of e to the i theta, or phi, and what it really means to plug in a solution to a differential equation and test it. Um, this is the, the smaller part. This is the bigger part, but they are kind of related. And one of the things that I just, I obviously did not emphasize enough in the first lecture on e to the i theta is there are basically five facts you just need to have memorized if you're going to go forward in physics. And memorize to the point that it's just ingrained in your system that you automatically think of these things. And I knew there was this moment of panic for all of us when I was asked what cosine and sine were again. Now I cheated on the, the test. I didn't give you the right hint. So if I look at this, one of the key things you'll notice is if I'm thinking in terms of complex numbers, an incredibly powerful tool is that cosine is the real part of e to the i phi and sine is the imaginary part of e to the i phi. And we'll come back to why this is so critical. And this was essential when you're looking at differential equations. And it really comes down to how much of physics is linear response and how much of things are based on linear operators. And when I do linear response, and I'll get it, say it again later, I can't say it enough, we have L of A plus B equals L of A plus L of B. And so I act separately on sine and cosine. Uh, and I don't mix the real and imaginary parts. And that is the key idea. Now the other thing that's often useful is of course the identities I did post. And to be honest, you know, in terms of thinking about and solving physics problems, I find I use this and these two probably more than I use these, particularly these days with Mathematica. Mathematica with the trig to exponential and exponential to trig command, um, you can get these pretty quickly. There are times w where the reason you want to know these is you've been working with e to the i phi and you really want to just double check in your head quickly that your answer is real. And if I see this combination, I know it's a cosine. So I know even though I have complex numbers, it's real. And if I see this combination with the i or an i up top, it doesn't really matter where the i is as long as this factor has an i. That's just a matter of a minus sign. Then again, I know I have basically plus or minus sign. And again, I'm dealing with something that's fundamentally real. So these are useful to have just because they give you that check, is my answer real? And so like when you're doing a Fourier series in exponential terms of a real function, you know your e to the i's and e to the minus i phi's better either come like this or like this um, because I've got to get sines and cosines. Because if it's a real function to begin with, it's got to be a real expansion when I'm done. Um, so it's a nice check on did you type things right, did you make any typos, did you do your algebra right? Um, so this, they're all useful. And you really just need to know these. That shouldn't have even have been an issue um, when I mentioned look in exponential form. It's kind of one of those non-negotiable math things as a physics major. Now, why is this so useful and powerful? As I said, the key idea in this is that most differential equations we look at, or at least many of them, are linear. And even the ones that are nonlinear, we often look at a linear approximation first. And so if I have cosine plus i sine, I can act separately on cosine and separately on sine and keep track of things, which means I can invert it. If I'm looking at behavior in terms of sines and cosines, I can look at the exponentials and then convert at the end. What does that mean? So here's a simple harmonic oscillator driven by a sine wave. It uh, could have been a cosine wave. You know, it just depends where I start my driving term, where t equals 0 is. Remember, sine and cosine are basically the same function. They're just shifted by 90 degrees. So if I'm starting with sine of omega t, then I know the other big thing about a linear operator is, 
all I can do to my sine, I can turn it into a cosine because the derivative sine is a cosine. That's a phase shift. I can multiply it by things so I can change its magnitude. But I can't change the omega t. Right? There's no linear operator on sine omega t I can do that will change the omega t. So most likely, or the only real solution I can get in steady state or long term for x is the same omega t dependence with a phase shift and an amplitude change. There are transients that can die away and other things, but this is the main steady state solution I want to look at. And it works to take this equation and then write everything in terms of the imaginary part of e to the i omega t. And I'll put my a inside there too. It doesn't really matter where the a goes because the a is real. And let's just check that explicitly with a particular linear operator. Right? If I take the derivative d by dt of e to the i omega t, what do I get? I omega, e to the i omega t. And if I multiply, whoops. So if I multiply that out in terms of cosine plus i sine, what do I get? Okay, so i omega cosine omega t. And then what's the next term? Minus, Minus sine omega, or sine omega, sine omega. omega t. Notice this is the derivative of what function? Uh, sine. And this is the derivative of what function? So indeed, what my linear operator has done right, is d by dt right, of cosine omega t plus i sine omega t, which is what that is, has acted in a linear fashion. It took d by dt of sine omega t and gave me omega cosine omega t. So the imaginary part of the derivative is the derivative of the imaginary part. And the real part of the derivative is the derivative of the real part. So it keeps the imaginary real part separate. So what I'm allowed to do is do everything in terms of e to the i omega t, and then wait to the end and take the imaginary part. If I was using cosines, I would do everything in terms of the real part so I would just, I guess, same thing. I would just plug in e to the i omega t, e to the i omega t, and I would take the real part at the end. And that's why it's so powerful, because using our derivatives of e to the i omega t work much better. Now, the other piece okay, is what to do with x of t. And there's a couple ways to treat it. Just so I write less. I would write it in terms of b star, which is b e to the i phi. You could write it either as the imaginary part of a real number times e to the i omega t plus phi, which is e to the i omega t times e to the i phi. Or you can combine these for now, recognize that this is a complex number, and just put it in here. Again, to put that into the two steps, right? remember what x of t was is b sine omega t plus phi. So if I write that out, that's the imaginary part of b e to the i omega t plus phi. But that, for an exponential, is the imaginary part of b e to the i phi e to the i omega t. And there's no reason not to carry that along as a single complex number, right? Because this is just the polar form of a complex number. I could write it as x plus i y. I could write it just as b star, the complex number, b e to the i phi.
And that is the other central idea that I think we really didn't get well enough in the first lecture. Okay? To understand this, and this is why exponentials are so powerful, because the exponential of a sum is a product of exponentials. And, and once I have multiplication, I can do it in any order and I can rearrange things. And now I have the e to the omega t stuff all by itself. And from a differential equation point of view, this is key because now if I plug in, this is the piece most people were pretty good at, but you were doing it with sines and cosines. Now, what does it mean? And this is that key other little thing. I wanted to focus on the complex numbers, but why do we use e to the omega t? Well, if I plug into a differential equation to check if I have a solution, right, the key is I want to be able to look at the coefficients of the different terms independently. Um, and with exponentials, it's trivial to do that because I see all of my e to the omega t's cancel out. I have no time dependence anymore, and I am simply looking at an algebraic equation for b star in terms of a. And I'm done. Now, the challenge with sines and cosines, most of you recognized in plugging in, just like with powers of n, right? If we were doing this as a power series in n of x of t to the n, I'll drop the t just because it's too hard to write. We recognize that we have to do each power separately. A lot of you recognize, OK, the coefficients of sine omega t and cosine omega t have to be done separately. But what you had a little bit of trouble with was you didn't really appropriately deal with the fact that there were phi's there. So you were doing things like canceling cosine omega t with cosine omega t plus phi. Well, those can't quite cancel yet because the phi is buried in here and you're not at the same t and you have to be careful. You have to use your sum rules. You want everything ultimately in terms of your cosine and your sine's omega t. So you would have to write this as cosine omega t cosine phi minus sine omega t sine phi. And you'd have to write this out as you know, sine omega t cosine phi plus uh, sine phi cosine omega t, and then regroup all your terms so your sine phi's and cosine phi's are floating around. Then you get two separate equations, and then you're done. So you can see the amount of algebra here is intensely more. So there's kind of like three things when I asked the problem that happened. Um, when I asked you to plug into a differential equation, one was um, complete failure to recognize to match terms. The other was incorrect matching of co terms. And then most of you who did, if you did it with an exponential, got it to match. So this idea of what you do when you plug into a differential equation and how it works out, right, the derivatives in this case would work pretty easily because what's the second derivative of a sign? A sign. So everything would be a sign and you wouldn't have to worry about it. Where everyone ran into trouble was the fact that I asked everyone to solve an equation more like this one. And when we're doing this, that derivative will give us cosines if I start with a sine. And now I have to figure out how to match the amplitudes correctly. But if I'm working in e to the i omega t, life remains just as easy because everything stays in e to the omega t. Whoops. Um, and I need an omega there. And now I again cancel my e to the omega t's, and I get a simple relation for b. And from here, 
Notice b is, as I advertised, now it's a complex number. Notice the previous case, b came out real. But for that differential equation, when we plugged in, sine just stayed sine. There was no phase shifts. Okay. Now sine really is going to go to sine omega t plus phi. There really is a phase shift because of this derivative term. The way to, easiest way to find the phase is get, um, write it in the standard form x plus i y, which I do in this case by what? Either using Mathematica command complex expand to find the phase, <laughs> or I multiply the top and bottom by the complex conjugate. And so I'm going to get a times omega naught squared minus omega squared minus i omega b over, now I don't really have to worry about the denominator because from the perspective of the phase, if that's all I'm after, this won't come in. I have to worry about it if I care about the amplitude. But for the phase, all I care about is the ratio of this to this with the minus sign. So the phase is the tangent inverse of minus omega b omega naught squared minus omega squared. And since I had defined b star as some real number e to the i phi, I have pulled out my phase shift by definition. Because remember, the phase is the tangent inverse of y over x. So whatever's down here is going to cancel out when I do y over x. Right? The, real, the full imaginary part is this over that. The full real part is this over that. But when I divide the two, this is going to cancel, <coughs> just like the a drops out. Is there like a more physics way of describing that? Like, like, is it like, the, like when you're out of phase, like when something's out of phase, it's, it's part of it's in the yeah, exactly. So, so if you think about it, remember, I said fully 90 degrees out of phase is just multiplying by i. So if the real part's 0 and this is something, then you're 90 degrees out of phase. Right? And that will show up because the tangent inverse of this over 0 will be 90. Right? And notice b in this case controls completely. If b is 0, the phase shift is 0. Right? So if there's no damping, there's no phase shift. And as b increases, you increase the phase shift. Right. And then if you hit resonance, right, you, you actually go through a 90-degree phase shift. There's a, there's a big phase shift that happens. There's something, you know, there's a discontinuity there at 90 degrees, at, at resonance. But again, it really takes, going back to the beginning, that our axial solution, right, is the imaginary part of B star e to the omega t. So if I wanted you to write the full solution, what are we doing? We will take the magnitude of b times the sine of omega t plus phi, because keep in mind, this becomes the magnitude of b times e to the i phi, e to the i omega t. This is our definition of b star. And then I take the imaginary part of that, and I get the sine, where phi is what we found up here. And the magnitude of b, we get from taking the magnitude of that thing, the whole thing that's up there hidden on the screen. And so that's how we piece everything together. And that really is the power of this. And that is why you absolutely must know, without any hesitation, these five facts, because they are the most powerful way to deal with linear systems, which most differential equations are. And understanding that when you plug into a differential equation and you're equating coefficients, if you have something like cosine omega t plus phi and cosine omega t, those are not the same thing yet. You need to expand out that cosine omega t plus phi and really get it to be something times cosine omega t. Likewise for the sine omega t. So if you had kept it in sines and cosines, you have to do that extra algebra. Right, B is e to the i phi here, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, and how come we can't just solve for, for phi by like doing a natural log or something? Um, it's, it's ugly because you have to take the natural log of a complex number and remember how to do that. Yeah. It's not a useful way to do it. 
Yeah, it's not a useful way to do it, right? Because you're taking the natural, I mean, it's sure, it is the natural log in a sense, but it's, but you, you have, you have, you just have a lot of strange stuff going on. Cause yeah, it's the, cause the natural log of this has the B in it still. And then you've got, an, a, you actually have I times phi and it's just, it's just a nasty math thing. Yeah, cause I, yeah, I did, so if you did B star over B na natural log of that divided by I, uh, if you did all the algebra, you could eventually get to the. Oh yeah, you would get it. But, but you're, you're also having to use the rules for taking natural log of complex yeah. numbers. And it, it's not a, it's, it's not nearly as clear and understandable a formula as this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you can do that. I just if, yeah. In principle, you could do okay. it. But like I said, from a physical point of view, it gives you no intuition. Whereas recognizing that phi really is, you know, the tangent inverse of the imaginary of the real part, which is what this is, we know how tangent inverse behaves, and this gives us some real physical intuition of what the phase is doing. Any other questions? So again, just from a class structure point of view, we did this at the beginning. Obviously, we didn't quite do it well enough <laughs> and enough of it. So hopefully now, after having a, an assignment where it failed miserably <laughs> and seeing it again um, going forward, um, you, you can fully expect to have to do this on the final. I now feel it has been covered well enough <laughs> um, that we would expect that.